Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Colbert. I am the executive director of the Canadian Public Health Association, and I will be your host and presenter today. I am joined by Natalie Brender, CPHA's director of policy as well. I want to start by acknowledging that while we are gathering from all parts of Turtle Island today, um, CPHA's offices are located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. So uh, today's webinar, uh, as part of Canadian Public Health Week 2023, is focusing on some work CPHA has been doing really over the past almost two years uh, in, de in development around advocacy for strengthening public health systems in Canada. So uh, I'm going to do a presentation about, uh, which is an overview of the policy brief. And then uh, at any point during the session, please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A module. Uh, and we will have a discussion about uh, everything that we've covered uh, towards the end. So uh, start by saying the pandemic has proved that something that we've known for decades, and that's that the collective health of Canadians requires collective solutions. And so we're calling on the federal government to lead in convening the provincial and territorial governments to collaborate in creating cohesive, comprehensive, and accountable public health systems for the benefit of everyone in Canada. By doing so, we can collectively accomplish two really important goals. First, we can improve the health and well being of Canadians. And second, we can reduce the burden on the primary and acute healthcare systems that have been so much in the news on a regular basis um, over the past year or so. In the face of the crises that the acute healthcare system is facing, it's really important to realize that demand on the acute care system is reduced when stronger public health systems keep people healthier. But public health systems can't be improved with short-term, quick-fix thinking. And unfortunately, that's the mindset of a lot of politicians. The thing that we're not asking for right now is a massive financial injection into public health. Um, it would be really easy to say, all we need is more money, but we know from experience especially in public health, money comes and goes in these cyclical, uh, in a cyclical fashion that does no good if we don't uh, fix the underpinning system. Instead, we're asking the federal government to make an investment of time and leadership in collaborative policy design. We're asking for work to reach pan-Canadian agreement on what coherent, comprehensive, and accountable public health systems should look like. So it's not always clear to people what public health is. And unfortunately, in our experience to date, um, with the meeting with uh, politicians, um, it's been clear that we say public health and they think publicly funded health care. Uh, but of course, you know uh, that this isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about the portion of the, the overall health system that is designed to keep people healthy. Now, common sense and the evidence tells us that preventing illness and injury is less expensive than curing people once they're sick. Yet the spending tallies show that Canadian governments prioritize medical services to treat disease and injury in individuals vastly more than the public health services that keep populations healthy. This status quo serves neither public well-being nor economic efficiency. And this is an argument that seems to uh, resonate with some of the politicians we've been talking to so far. So what's missing from the public health landscape today are clear mandates with nationally cohesive goals, standards, monitoring, and accountability. And federal leadership is needed now because because public health systems across Canada today don't have the structural frame, frameworks they need for excellent nationwide results. We need a better framework to set these mandates, identify the goals, resource them effectively, and then report, monitor, and do the accountability work that needs to be done. The renewal of public health systems needs to address their structural components through an investment in collaborative policy design. Now, the federal government can't do this alone. They certainly don't have all the answers. Um, 
uh, and, and we're not asking the federal government to do it alone. We are asking the federal government to convene the right players. So the province and provinces and territories, along with other stakeholders, have to collaborate and deliver. But we really feel that the federal government must take the initiative and lead the policy collaboration. And we're specifically talking to the federal government about those policy levers, uh, legislative, regulatory, or policy levers that po politicians have at their disposal, and only politicians can do something about. There are broader systemic issues uh, within public health systems that also need to be addressed. We're very aware of this, but those can be addressed by the system itself once these foundational pieces are addressed by the politicians. So um, when we talk to uh, our politicians, uh, we talk to them uh, in, in these different buckets. And the first is what public health does. So here we're talking about the core functions and population, population health goals that we feel are essential pillars of what public health does. While this, the, the scope of the six functions is broadly endorsed by the public health community, in practice, their content is defined and translated into action quite variably across Canadian jurisdictions. Depending on where you are, uh, for example, health promotion may not even uh, be mentioned in your Provincial Public Health Act. And we all know that if it's not mentioned in the Public Health Act, funding for a specific activity can be uh, derailed very easily. So, uh, in many of the uh, so m many of the uh, public health acts across the country are decades old, and don't give adequate definition to what all of the six core functions means. And this variation is incompatible with achieving cohesive, comprehensive, and accountable public health systems across Canada. That doesn't mean that we're going to have identical systems in every province and territory, but that they are cohesive and comprehensive uh, is, is the key point here. Now, a second requirement for strengthening Canadian, uh, Canadian public health systems is the development of a set of population health goals that public health services would then be expected to fulfill. Today, we see a patchwork approach sorry, a patchwork approach across provinces and territories with inconsistent public health goals and significant difficulties in measuring and reporting comparable outcomes. So public health data, surveillance systems that don't talk to each other, uh, incomparable statistics. So it stands, in the, and this stands in the way of nationwide comparisons, performance evaluation, and accountability for the governance design. It prevents us from understanding how well our workforce and finances are being used. The next pillar is the who delivers public health. So um, we know that public health is quite different from other parts of the health system. Our workforce is comprised of a highly diverse professional, uh, highly diverse professionals with uh, very different disciplinary backgrounds. Now, some enter the workforce with specialized education in public health, but many do not. That's why it's imperative that professionals entering the public health workforce be able to learn the foundational approaches of public health and acquire new skills to address the health of various population groups. We have to start with the question, what are the basic competencies needed to work in public health and how do people acquire them? Now, we know that after the 2003 SARS crisis, there was agreement that Canada needed to define competencies for its public health workforce and training to develop those competencies. But 20 years later, those initiatives have dwindled away. Uh, a description of the core competencies of public health in Canada was published in 2007, but it's very high level and it doesn't re reflect the evolving needs of public health today. Also after SARS, FACT took on the need to improve training for practitioners already in the workforce by developing a skills online program for continuing education. But that program, as you know, was discontinued in 2018. Today, there's no comprehensive online training available for Canadian professionals who want to upgrade their public health competencies. Finally, 
we talk about the governance of public health systems and the shortcomings that require federal leadership to address uh, them to directly and to model action for other jurisdictions. So there are many gaps in the governance of public health systems in Canada, and many of them originate with the ambiguous role of the federal government in public health. While a narrow set of federal responsibilities is assigned by the Constitution Act, in practice, the federal government takes on a broader set of responsibilities in, public, in the public health landscape. These activities include supplying public health evidence to inform federal decision making, informing parliamentarians and Canadians on public health issues, as well as shaping and funding the public health research ecosystem. There are also strong reasons for assigning to the federal government responsibilities in the areas of data systems, planning for public health emergencies, and bolstering the availability of public health services in less well-resourced jurisdictions. As the pandemic has made very clear, Canada's public health systems are governed, governed with little harmonization across federal, provincial, territorial, regional, and municipal levels. So, our recommendations are to the federal government are as follows. As a first step, we're calling on the federal government to establish a cross-jurisdictional public health systems working group. And the first charge of, of this group will be to define the core functions of public health services in Canada. So obviously this group is going to have to include uh, provincial and territorial representatives along with professional associations uh, and other key stakeholders uh, who have uh, knowledge and key insights into um, the core functions. Next, once the core functions uh, for public, uh, the core public health functions, sorry, are agreed on, they should be translated into high level population health goals, specifying outcomes that public health services will be accountable to deliver. These goals need to be matched with outcome indicators to measure progress towards achieving them. In the area of workforce competencies, um, we, we really can't have high quality public health services uh, without these competencies descriptions and high quality professional development. So our workforce has to have the, the, the necessary competencies to carry out the, their mandate. That's why we're calling for an updated set of public health comp competency descriptions based on new statements of public health functions and goals to underpin a cohesive and comprehensive uh, pan-Canadian public health system. Now, I know that preliminary work is being done on updating the core competencies. And, and this is important work, and it's, it's great that this work is being, is being um, pursued. But the, the new set of competencies can't just be an academic exercise of saying, well, oh, this would be nice if our workforce had these competencies. Uh, workforce competencies need to be integrated by public health employers into the hiring, the evaluation and performance appraisal of everyone working within the public health system to make them a real and, 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 and to get their real value out of them. Uh, we're also calling for the reestablishment of a high quality training program to meet two press, pressing demands confronting the public health workforce. One is training for the flood of new workers who are entering the public health field um, since the COVID-19 pandemic and who lack a grounding in fundamental public health approaches and skills. Second, the public health workforce needs new complex skills to meet the needs of 21st century populations. Major skill gaps currently exist in areas including Indigenous health, ecological determinants of health, community engagement, data management, risk communications and leadership, just to name a few. So there's a definite need for training. This is different from education, which could be uh, through uh, uh, um, university programs. This is training for ex existing public health professionals or for those health professionals who want to start working in the context of public health. And finally, we're calling on the federal government to lead the creation of a new Canada Public Health Act that would make explicit what public health is and what the federal government's responsibilities are for supporting it. We're also calling for the gov federal government to embrace a range of governance practices, enabling public health expertise to inform healthy public policy. And 
again, we want the, the work group to be able to model for jurisdictions across Canada how um, uh, governance systems can be strengthened in Canada to make sure that we uh, retain our connection to com the communities that we serve while still uh, achieving these, uh, these higher level population health goals. So what we're asking the federal government to champion isn't a big injection of federal funding right now, but a commitment of federal time and leadership to get the foundations of public health shored up. The issues we're pointing out can't be treated as a grab bag of ideas. This has to be a sustained effort looked at um, that looks at all of the structural elements together as a system because they're all functionally interconnected. As was often stated during the height of the pandemic, Canada's public health systems are the first line of defense while our hospitals are the last line of defense. This applies to normal times as much as during a global pandemic. The efforts we're proposing can have a long lasting positive impact on the health of Canadians and the health of our, health of our economy. Again, it's common sense that healthier populations will reduce pressure on acute health care, which will keep it available for when Canadians really need it. Everyone knows that health systems have to be fixed. What public health needs now is a federal commitment creating co to, to create cohesive, comprehensive, and accountable systems at the provincial territorial levels. Doing this is the pathway to stronger public health systems and a healthier population. So we have uh, had uh, some great uh, meetings already. Uh, we launched on December 13th. Uh, and later in that month, we had uh, a meeting with the Office of the Minister of Health. Uh, in January, we met with the Office of the Minister of Finance, uh, who is also the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, we've had meetings with Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada and numerous senators and members of parliament meetings that we've either already had or are scheduled for the near future. Uh, given all of what is the, the hectic schedule of, of all these players, uh, we were very pleased that we got such a positive response in people accepting our invitations for meetings. Um, and uh, certainly uh, the, the response has been generally positive, although we understand it's a big ask that we're making of the federal government. Uh, this is uh, going to be a long-term initiative by CPHA, and certainly our commitment is to continue uh, with our calls to, to see this renewal of, of public health systems across the country. Um, so we can't do it alone. Uh, and we're certainly looking for support from the public health community uh, in the work that we're doing. So uh, please take a moment to visit our campaign web, uh, web page to access all of our campaign resources. Uh, and we're going to continue to add new resources over time. So check back on a regular basis. If you're uh, inspired, write a letter to the editor or an op-ed piece for your local newspaper. Uh, and get thinking, it's really important to get people thinking about the importance of public health systems. Uh, I think it's particularly challenging right now because uh, there is uh, an, a higher level of distrust of, of uh, governance, uh, governments and, and uh, uh, official bodies these days. Uh, and so we need to remind people what public health systems do for them. Um, Certainly take the time to write to your federal and provincial territorial elect, elected representatives. Um, they need to hear your voice. Uh, they need to know that this is important to people. Talk to your neighbors and your family members, uh, get them engaged. Uh, and then finally, if you are a member of an organization that should be supporting our work, talk to your leadership team about endorsing our policy brief. Uh, and feel free to uh, contact me directly if you want more details about uh, how that can happen. And you can write to me at ceo at cpha.ca. So that is the end of our formal presentation right now. And hopefully uh, we've given you something to think about. And uh, you have some questions for Natalie and I. So Natalie, uh, have we gotten any questions in yet? We do, we have one question so far. Um, and it is, do you have any intent, do you have intentions of meeting with anyone at Indigenous Services Canada to ensure we are encompassing Indigenous public health? 
Excellent question. Thanks very much, Montana, for that. Um, so uh, we don't have immediate plans to do that. Uh, for one, the most important reason is we're not an Indigenous organization. We're not well positioned to say what should or shouldn't be done. Uh, and, and with that, I turn to uh, the uh, paper that was commissioned by the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada for her 2021 annual report that talks about uh, First Nations Inuit Métis vision for public health uh, and population health in Canada. Um, they have that vision. Uh, it is now very important uh, for politicians to listen to them and uh, start enacting those things uh, that they have called for. Um, and CPHA will be there to support them. Uh, and we have a, a established relationship with uh, Assembly of First Nations, Inuit Tempiric Kanatami, and the Métis National Council. Uh, and uh, we're always ready to support their efforts in, the, in that respect. And just to jump in and add that in, indeed yep. we do say as much and we do say this in our um, advocacy brief, you know, that we, we say we fully support, you know, the calls that Indigenous organizations are making for their public health needs. Excellent. So uh, I don't see any other questions right at the moment. Um, there we go. Sarah has a question for us. So in what ways have climate health considerations been integrated into these efforts to strengthen public health system? Uh, quite honestly, uh, Sarah, this is one of those areas of I, I see that as an internal to public health uh, conversation to have. It's it's absolutely an essential question, uh, uh, essential essential issue that needs to be addressed. But as I mentioned, we're focusing specifically on um, issues that only the politicians have the power to do something about. And, and so it's very much those structural elements that we're talking about. If we get those aligned, uh, like obviously there's tons of work being done uh, on, on the climate health, climate action uh, side of things. Uh, CPHA has projects, uh, like it, it, it's, it's, it's going on uh, across the board. Um, so it, we're not saying it's not important. It's just a different conversation than the one we're trying to have uh, with the federal government right now. And if we've learned anything, we have to stay focused in these conversations with politicians because uh, they can be distracted very easily uh, and, and get off topic uh, and, and not be clear about what we're asking them for. So thanks for that question. Can I add one other thing, Ian? Please do. Um, which is that the structural elements we're focusing on, they are very much the enabling conditions that will allow public health to be more effective in dealing with climate change related issues. I mean, by, by making sure it's understood in all jurisdictions that health promotion uh, is part of it and that uh, health, public health professionals have the capacities and the training um, and that it's built into the public health systems nationwide that there is to be attention given to climate adaptation. All of these things are the enabling conditions structurally that will let public health professionals do that work. Great. Thank you very much, um, Natalie, for that. Uh, so Kathleen, I think everybody can see your question. So I'm not going to reread the whole thing, but I absolutely feel for you. And that's partially what um, to, to address the situation that you're talking about is, is why we feel it's so important to A, update public health legislation, uh, so that uh, the core functions are entrenched in legislation uh, and that there be indicators uh, and, and population health goals established so that there is a legislative requirement um, to, um, to, to take action on, on different issues. It also ties into the work that needs to be done around governance. There is... Um, it's, it's, it's very clear right now that there is this tension between the role of public health as an arm of government um, and the role of, of medical officers of health and chief medical, uh, medical officers of health. They're there to advise uh, the politicians who were elected to make decisions, uh, but they, don't, they aren't independent. Like to be clear, they're not independent and they can't speak out because they're government employees. And so we need to improve and, and create modern governance structures uh, that 
uh, allow public health systems to to be truth tellers, to to share the evidence uh, without kind of that political filter, uh, so that we can avoid the type of situation that you describe uh, in your question. Okay. So um, the next question is from uh, Inga. Uh, are there some early wins through dialogue with federal government uh, to inform their work through healthy public policy perspective in a range of areas the feds are working on? Um, I will be honest and say, uh, no, there's no early wins in any of our work. Um, this is a long, slow, drawn out process of conversation after conversation after conversation of driving home to people that um, there is uh, a role for federal politicians, for parliamentarians uh, to play in this. Um, and it, it's it's challenging, uh, but we are uh, absolutely committed to doing it. Uh, and I we'll, we'll let you know if we get any quick early wins. As individual um, politicians, I think there's a lot of support. It's then how do you translate that individual support to systemic change? How do you get the Senate um, uh, Committee on science, uh, science and Technology to actually study this question? And then how do you get a uh, legislation formed up? So it, it's we're at the very, very beginning of this process. Um, but it's also why it's really important that public health workers across the public health professionals across the country actually get actively involved and write letters, uh, engage with, uh, with their community outside of your your nine to five job um, as citizens raising this as an issue, because we know that front porch issues are the ones that get attention during elections. Um, but uh, and it's hard to raise the, the profile of public health services in people's mind. A lot of people think, well, that's just the government service. It's there. It should be there. Um, uh, we don't really have to pay a, a lot of attention to it. So um, I think that uh, there is an opportunity for the public health community to become more engaged uh, and help uh, push this along. And writing to a senator is always a good thing uh, because uh, they um, aren't under the same time constraints of, of elected members of parliament. Uh, and they do have a longer um, worldview uh, on some of these issues. So I uh, strongly recommend that. Uh, next question, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name because I will pronounce it horribly, uh, but you write, I wonder what would be the consequence or implications to CPHA or public health for Canadians if provinces push for privatization in medicine health care? Um, that's a huge question. I'm I'm probably not well established or well positioned to to answer that question. Um, I do think that generally speaking, we see that uh, when healthcare services are privatized, they're more expensive and patient outcomes are poor. Um, so you're putting more money into a system that uh, has uh, delivers poor results. So so not not a, a a positive situation at all. Um, I often reflect on the last report of the um, Health Council of Canada. That was the body that was established to monitor the, the major injection of funds into the healthcare system in the 90s. Uh, and uh, when it was disbanded by Prime Minister Harper, uh, their final report, which could finally tell the absolute truth because there were all a lot of jobs anyway, said, look, you've funneled millions and millions and millions of new dollars into the healthcare system, but you haven't improved outcomes at all. So you're measuring the wrong things and you're trying to change, shift the wrong um, uh, parts of the system. So I think that th that's an important lesson learned from, from that process that throwing money at health isn't necessarily a, a good solution. So I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but it's uh, doing the best I can. Um, sorry, just catching up. So Malcolm. Um, 
Thank you for reinforcing the need for initiatives to modernize the core competencies to include working with the practice environment to integrate competencies into professional roles and responsibilities, job definitions, definitions and professional development. This is, oh, this is a priority for this work going forward. Great. <laughs> Glad that you agree, Malcolm. It's, uh, it is absolutely a priority that um, the, the, the new core competencies be more than a document that sits on a shelf uh, and uh, um, uh, we, we really integrate it into the entire workforce uh, experience. So, uh, Claire, um, hi Claire, asks, what was the appetite to define or refresh the public health core functions and establish public health goals? What might be the next steps? Um, I would say, generally speaking, that we've had fairly positive uh, responses from everyone that we've met with, um, completely non-committal as far as the the um, government sources that we've spoken to in both um, the the minister's office, Minister to Close office, and uh, Minister Freeland's office. Uh, I think that they are. Um, when we've originally spoke to them, they were um, all overwhelmed with um, getting uh, health deals signed with the provinces, uh, doing work on the um, healthcare professionals crisis. Um, so getting their attention is, is still the, the, a big challenge. So um, I, I would say that um, time will tell. Uh, it, it's it's still very early days, so uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that too is kind of a non-answer. But the best I can give you today. Can I chime in with one thought on Please. that, Ian? Um, which is that you know when we're at, so Ian described what some of the feedback we get when we talk with officials. When we talk with um, senators and MPs, you know, a large part of the conversation is just getting their mind around that we're not talking about publicly funded health care, we're talking about public health. And then the next conversation is often, but that's the responsibility of the provinces, not the Fed. So why are you talking at this level? And then we need to make the point that we're not saying, you know, as in terms of shared goals, we're saying, yes, there can be different provincial territorial systems, but it's worth talking about um, common visions of goals, if only, for example, because we're asking, we, we know the federal government's going to be placing a huge amount of money in health data systems. And it tends to be that once we bring up the idea of giant federal investment in health data, then it helps people understand why we need to have conversations about goals before we know what the data systems will measure. So that's kind of how those conversations have been going. Thank you, Natalie. That's that's great. Uh, so Olayinka, I apologize if I, I mispronounce your name, uh, asks, how can we advocate for more public health funding to adequately serve communities? Well, as, as I've said a couple of times, uh, in, in our um, process, we're not asking for money first. We're asking for collaborative policy development. Uh, we need solutions to some of the, what we see are some of the bigger problems. And in fact, we don't necessarily have, CPHA doesn't have the answers. Uh, we, we, we're we giving direction as to where some of those answers might be, but we're putting a lot of weight on this, this idea of an intersectoral working group uh, that would bring together the right minds. Uh, and then there would be some groups that, that form out of that to work on specific issues. Um, we have to have a big table uh, to, to hash out some of these issues. And we'll never have 100% agreement. I, 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 that's the public health community at its best. Uh, but I think we can uh, forge ahead. But if we don't get the pillars of the system set right, it doesn't matter how, how much money we pour into it. Um, a great example, uh, something that I have seen is with, uh, in, in those jurisdictions where uh, public health services have been centralized along with, uh, with healthcare services, um, public health has been drawn away from its roots in community. And so the bureaucratization and centralization of health services has really done a disservice. This is anecdotal, I, I, I realize it's, it's, it's not the evidence that we need, uh, but uh, a big part of the governance um, section that we talk about is how do we keep public health firmly rooted in community? Um, how do we make sure that they know who core, their, their key community partners are 
in the case of an emergency, uh, as we saw with COVID-19. Unfortunately, a lot of communities had to start from scratch. Not a, all of them. A lot of them had really robust relationships with, with community organizations. Uh, but uh, it, that is one example uh, of getting the foundations right so that when you put more money in the system, A, you know how much money you're going to actually need, and you're putting it into a excuse me, a system that is better prepared to receive it and do accomplish the goals that you've already set for that system to accomplish. Uh, and then, um, oh, from uh, Alshima, sorry. Printing is too small. My my eyes. I'm getting old. Oshima, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for wishing us a happy National Public Health Week from the United States, and of course, it's Canadian Public Health Week here as well. We're not quite as well organized as the American Public Health Association, but uh, this is just our second year of doing that. So, thank you for those uh, well wishes. Uh, and then Jocelyn, uh, aside from the complexity of restructuring, what are your thoughts on creating a single system that is adaptable and responsible to the local context versus having multiple systems as we currently do? Well, Jocelyn, if you mean multiple systems as in different provinces and territories, I don't think we're ever going to get away from that. Um, that would require constitutional amendments, and we know that this is a country that is now terrified of the thought of doing constitutional amendments. Um, but I think that we can work towards a pan-Canadian um, uh, uh, agreement on higher level goals that can be um, that can level the playing field across the country. Um, that there, I always use the example that uh, we have different uh, vaccine registries uh, in different uh, provinces. Doesn't really make a lot uh, of sense to me. Uh, sorry, not vaccine registries, but um, um, now I'm forgetting what it's called. Uh, but uh, uh, what different vaccines are covered uh, in different jurisdictions, and that really makes no sense to me. Now there can be some regional variations uh, as as to different vaccine preventable diseases that are of of importance or are of concern. Uh, but uh, there should be greater consistency in our systems. Um, the one of the great strengths of public health is that it responds to local conditions and the needs of specific communities. And that is not at odds with this idea of pan-Canadian goals. Uh, and, and it just takes, we just have to wrap our head around that. Uh, it, it, we can be strong on both sides, um, both responding to local conditions, but also achieving uh, pan-Canadian goals. So, um, I were there. Is there any more comments or questions? Well, I won't belabor it. Um, it's been great to have the questions we've had so far. Um, I do encourage everyone to get involved uh, and talk to your colleagues about getting involved. Um, go to our website. Just cpha.ca, there's a link right off the home page um, to our, our uh, a, a specific page for this campaign. The policy brief there is there, summaries, uh, some fact sheets, uh, uh, an FAQ uh, that is, is helpful, but definitely get engaged and, and talk to, get family and friends interested in what you do. You can finally like have that conversation. You work in public health, what does that mean? Are you working in an ER? No. <laughs> have that conversation. Uh, my mother never understood what I did. So there you go. Uh, oh, Saganya, uh, what are the healthcare scheme for public health? Um, I'm not certain I understand the question. Um, if someone else who is on the line uh, uh, or part of the webinar understands the question better, perhaps you can uh, uh, put a clarification. Unfortunately, I can't uh, respond to that question. But definitely do, as I say, get involved, uh, write a letter, um, write an op-ed. Uh, we are going to, this is a long-term initiative of, of CPHA. We knew going into this, this wasn't going to be easy or a fast wind. We really started this process thinking that there would be uh, provincial and uh, territorial and possibly a federal review of the COVID response. That's becoming very clear that it's not going to happen. And quite honestly, given the state of politics in this country right now, um, I don't want it to happen because it will just be 
become a political sideshow. Um, and, and we don't need that and it won't actually help anything. But we are using um, the the salience of the pandemic to maintain the intention of politicians uh, and get them engaged in, the, in this conversation. And it's going to be an ongoing conversation and uh, look forward to having you part of that as we go forward. So I don't think there's any more questions uh, today. Thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned before, uh, the session is being recorded and will be posted to CPHC's YouTube channel and all registrants will receive uh, notification when it becomes available. Have a great day and have a great Canadian Public Health Week. Bye-bye.